And I don't know if Adam, here he is, Mike Corey. Before I introduce Frank Schellenberger, I want to mention the next few meetings. Next month we're having Ray Francis and Bill Grant each splitting the main presentation. We'll have no mini presentation. And Bill Grant, who is here tonight, is going to be talking about the health benefits of the sun and vitamin D. And he is one of the original sources on that subject that's being uh, published recently uh, with Halleck's book and a lot of controversy. And, it's, uh, and Ralph Moss uh, refers to him as well as, oh, a dozen other people. Uh, now, and November 11th is the only day we're changing to the second Thursday instead of the third, because Julian Whitaker is going to be at the ACAM conference then, and he cannot make uh, that uh, other date, but he will be here on November 11th. And uh, the tentative topic is also molecular treatments for chronic diseases, but it's up to him to uh, change that. On the 16th, we're having Gerald Reven, who I think formulated the Syndrome X concept, and is going to talk about the uh, insulin resistance, moderate alcohol consumption, and risk of cardiovascular disease. On January 20th, and both of these are now the third Thursdays again, Paris Kidd is talking on phospholipids and omega-3 fatty acids for brain vitality, recent advances. And in February, which is not on the schedule here, we're getting uh, Lance Morris speaking on uh, vitamin C and Hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic. That's, uh, that's right. Say that again. Hyaluronic. Hyaluronic acid. And um, a couple of people in this room are at the Cancer Control Society where he spoke and they said, you've got to uh, get him here. And then I listened to his videotape and I spoke to him and he said he's coming out. Uh, let me see now. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Frank Schellenberger, who is the founder and medical director of the Nevada Center. He's a board certified, board certified in anti-aging medicine and has served as a clinical instructor in family medicine at UC Davis. He is uh, president of the Nevada State Homeopathic and the Integrated Medical Association, and he's in the inventor of bioenergy testing a patented test procedure which uses oxygen uptake analysis to determine mitochondrial energy dynamics. He's written a book entitled Bursting with Energy, which describes his research into how humans make energy and what improves energy production, and we've got copies there. And I want to point out that uh, my wife and I watched a preliminary uh, uh, video of his talk and the only complaint she had is, uh, what are the solutions? And then I gave her the book. And there are ten chapters, ten solutions, that are explained in detail in there. And I hope he'll cover as many as possible tonight. Anyway, he's a pioneer in the use of ozone in medicine, and has published a book and several papers on the clinical application of oxidative medicine, a new discipline that emphasizes the profound importance of oxygen and energy production and health and longevity. He's won no recycling events and gone at silver medals in the Nevada State Mountain Bike Championship Series and Northern California Time Trails Trials. He aims to keep himself and his patients young and energetic for a long, long time. And you know, he's proof of his system working. He doesn't need a lot. I've got a lot of there. Oh, good, thanks. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. I um, want to also uh, thank Mike, thank Bill. Appreciate it very much for inviting me here. And uh, finally, I want to thank Christine. Uh, she has helped to make my slides much better for you. You can understand them much better. I, on the other hand, would be very confused because they're all different, but. Uh, Let's see what we can do. Um, let's see, you know about the books? We got that down. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been out of medical school for about 33 years now, and uh, because I'm a little bit of a slow learner, it took me about six, seven years to realize that they didn't teach me everything in medical school. But starting somewhere in the late 70s, um, 
I started to realize uh, in a very unusual way that oxygen was important. Imagine that. Um, what happened was in 1981, I was organizing a, a, a conference, and a fellow by the name of Charlie Farr, whom some physicians here might remember, uh, who was a pioneer in the use of hydrogen peroxide. He's basically taking hydrogen peroxide and injecting it intravenously into patients, and they were getting better. In fact, uh, it was so interesting that I had Charlie come out from Oklahoma to San Francisco and give our group a talk, and pretty much everybody in the audience sat there the whole time going, what? Because what Charlie was saying is, you know, basically no matter what's wrong with your patient, if you inject hydrogen peroxide in it, in his Oklahoma accent, you just put a little hydrogen peroxide in there, they get it right away. <laughs> and, uh, and, but uh, yeah, you have some data to prove that. And you know, if I'm listening to somebody and they're telling me something I already believe, I'm not too interested in it. But if they tell me something I don't believe, that really perks my curiosity a lot. And back in the early 80s, you guys probably remember free radicals were killing everybody and it was oxidant stress and all this stuff. Not that that's not true, but it seemed a little hard to believe that some guy is going to come along and give oxidants intravenously and cure people. So I was immediately intrigued, started to study it, and that has led me down this path to where I am tonight. Um, early on, uh, I got interested in ozone, and uh, nobody at that time was using ozone in the United States. I went over to Germany, where it's been used for the last 30 years, and started studying the use of ozone. Ozone, as you may know, is three oxygen atoms, not two. The oxygen we're breathing in the room is two oxygen atoms. That's the stable form of oxygen. You stick a third one on there. Now you've got a little bit more oxygen, a little bit more power to it, and it's a whole lot more reactive. So um, I studied ozone, and that took me up into about the early 80s. At that point, I was reflecting, you know what? I give ozone to just about everybody that walks in my door, and I have a general practice. So I see fatigue states, cancer, MS, name me something. I see it routinely. Uh, I give just about everybody this ozone treatment, and it's my impression that just about everybody gets some serious benefit out of it. Why? What's the deal? How can you can have one thing and it makes everybody with every condition better. Uh, so in the early 80s, then I set out to find that out. And the first thing that occurred to me, it's got oxygen. It's got an extra oxygen in there. So instead of them just breathing room air and having two oxygens that come in in a stable state, now I'm injecting something where there's a third oxygen atom is unstable. It's going to bounce off the other two and go do something. So I thought, you know what, maybe I ought to have a way of measuring oxygen. So it took me about two or three years to kind of go through several ideas uh, of me how to measure oxygen in people. And ultimately, I discovered that there was a way to do this that uh, had been developed for the Nassau Sciences. And, uh, and this was a very simple little apparatus. It's a picture of my book. But basically, it's an O2 analyzer. And it does two things. It's got a mouthpiece. It'll analyze all the air that goes into your body and all the air that comes out of your body. And basically, it's going to tell you how much oxygen is disappearing into your body and how much carbon dioxide is coming out of your body. Now, in this day of you know, panels of you know, 483 items, maybe that doesn't sound like too much. It's just telling me two things. But from my perspective, those are really interesting things. Because you and I live based upon one principle, one single principle. It's the most fundamental principle that makes us alive. We heard about toxicity tonight. Toxicity isn't what keeps us alive, or a lack of it thereof. One thing keeps us alive, and that's the ability to convert oxygen, which is a very high energy molecule, to carbon dioxide, which is a very low energy molecule. By that conversion, energy is released, it's harnessed, we get to stay alive. And this test tells me how we're doing it. I can tell you how much oxygen is going in, how much CO2 is coming out. Uh, so I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. So I went out and uh, I bought one of these devices. They're kind of pricey. And um, my wife wasn't entirely pleased with uh, me going out and buying something about the price of a car. It was of no use to anybody but some guy that wanted to know how much oxygen was going in and how much carbon dioxide was coming out. 
I really didn't have much of an idea what I was getting into, but I started to study this. And I started to learn some very interesting things. Namely, I figured out a way to take that chemical conversion of oxygen to carbon dioxide, throw it through a few equations that were well known at the time, and determine the actual amount of energy that must have been produced. And that's kind of what I'm going to go through tonight. I'm going to uh, take you through this little journey and, and, and show you why I think the one single thing that keeps us alive, keeps us healthy, and kills us is our energy production. Uh, the earlier speaker talked about toxicity. And what does toxicity do? Toxicity ruins your energy production. I mean, that's one thing that we can see all the time. When I look at my energy production, if it's down, I put the patient on a three-week detox program, come back and measure it, and guess what? Very often, it's better. And that's due to detox detoxification and the effect of removing toxicity. <laughs> but it gets more insidious than that. All of this energy stuff is like a vicious cycle because the issue is this. In order for your liver to detoxify, talk about phase one, phase two detoxification, in order for your liver to do that, what does it need? It needs energy. It uses ATP to do that. That ain't free. You don't get a lot of free rides in this system of ours. Every single solitary metabolic product Pro, uh, property in your human body, every nanosecond is dependent on only one thing, and that's energy. You don't have to eat, you don't have to drink water, you don't have to take B12, but you better breathe. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's let's see what she's done to my slides now. Okay, uh, if you lose money, you lose lose a little. You lose your reputation, you lose a lot, you guys know the punchline. You lose your health, you pretty much lose everything. That's why you're here instead of out doing something that could be a lot more fun. <laughs> um, this is probably not a lot new for you, except maybe one of these ideas. This is a new paradigm of medicine. You know, I've, I've always thought, in the back of my head, uh, having started out in emergency medicine, which is pretty simple, really, you know, put a tube in this, put a tube in that, everything's okay. Um, that there should be a specialty in medicine called no-brainer medicine, where everything's really, really, really simple. And I finally figured out a way to do that. And no-brainer medicine is what I call the uh, new paradigm of the future. Basically, where nobody gets sick in the first place. Wouldn't that be cool? That we don't have to treat diseases, because you never got sick. In which case, my role is simply that of doing something to keep you well. And what I hope to convince you is what that amounts to is keeping your energy up. Um, that we treat the, the reason that you're getting sick, not just the symptoms. And finally, that there's one disease, one treatment. Now that's pretty no-brainer, isn't it? So it really fits my criteria. The one disease, of course, is low energy. And the one treatment is improve energy production. Okay, so Jackie Mason, at this age it's no longer a question of staying healthy, it's a question of finding the sickness you like. <laughs> and uh, maybe from the last figure you wonder if that isn't pretty much a sure outcome. My take on toxicity is not to run around and wonder what's in every crummy little glass I drink. I've got more time than that. My idea is more macho than that. I say, bring it on. Bring it on, because I've got so much energy in here, I want to kick it out as soon as it gets in me. Uh, to me, it's a, it's, it works better. I like that idea. Disease is, in fact, preventable. Duh. It's not too shocking, but you know, somebody had to actually go out and prove that. Okay, so. So uh, this study right here is an 83 study. In fact, so I guess we've known diseases preventable for all, over 20 years now. In the 10 years between 72 and 82, the annual mortality rate in the United States from non-cardiac disease decreased about 8%. Coronary artery disease, 28% stroke. For, well, it's decreasing. Clearly, something's causing it to decrease. So. Pretty much any disease that's out there, any disease that you and I can get, is preventable. 
All we now have to know is how to prevent it. And I think the answer has to do with bioenergetics. Bioenergetics is the subject that more or less deals with how energy is made in the human body. So, I kind of alluded to this. Why, why is energy, why is bioenergetics so fundamental? Well, it's only because every single thing that happens in your experience as a living being is centered around energy. Every function of your organ, your senses, how your body repairs itself. Ever notice that when you got a sprained ankle when you were 15, it was okay the next day, and you got a sprained ankle when you were 50, and it wasn't? That's repair. It takes energy. Thoughts take energy. Um, sometimes I'm wondering a little bit about the American people and how much they're thinking these days. And it could be that they're just low on energy. Uh, reproduction. <laughs> digestion. Hormones. Elimination. Detoxification. Whatever you want to say. Name something. Name your favorite thing. The last book you read. It depends on energy. So, what happened was that I was riding my bike one day, and it's about the only time my little brain can get, you know, not thinking about, I mean, stay in the moment, you know, it makes me keep in the moment. And I'm thinking about, you know what, as you get older, your energy levels go down. As you get older, your energy levels go down. And, you know, that's just the price of getting older. As you get older, your energy levels go down. And, uh, and then I don't know what happened, but you know, one of those times like weird things happen, all of a sudden I thought, maybe you get older because your energy levels go down. It suddenly occurred to me. And I thought, maybe you get older because your energy levels go down. Maybe you get older. Well, if that's the case, and your energy levels don't go down, maybe we're on to a little something here. So, you know, up until about three weeks ago, I thought I was really brilliant with this. I thought I had really discovered something real interesting. Uh, and then about three weeks ago, I was in Singapore giving a lecture, and some Chinese guy came up and told me, he says, you know, we Chinese guys have been saying that for 3,000 years. We call it chi. And if you keep your chi up, you don't get sick or age. And when your chi goes down, and I said, well, how do you guys do with this? He says, we look at the tongue and feel the pulse. Um, Basically, I was only behind 3,000 years. <laughs> I could have been worse. But uh, fortunately, uh, because of my high technology, I finally caught up to that curve. And uh, where he's reading pulses and tongues, I'm reading oxygen consumption, but we're both measuring the same thing. We're measuring chi. I like mine better because it's quantitative. It's reproducible. You can run the test, you can run the test, you can run the test, and the results are all exactly the same. It's not operator dependent at all. So anyhow, this realization about energy brought me along to this, uh, what I call an energy deficit theory of aging, which is what this book is all about. So tonight, hopefully, I'm going to have enough time to go over two case examples. I brought two case examples from this week that I just did. And as I run through that, I'll give you an idea of what you were saying, what, what do you do about it. Uh, but the book does go into rather good detail of what I've learned over the last seven, eight years from using this test. And basically, it's simple. I measure how you produce energy. I do something to you. I see if it got better. If it didn't get better, that didn't work. End of story. And uh, after a while, I started figuring out things that work and things that don't work. And that's more or less what the book's all about. So this is the energy deficit theory of aging. This is what I think. The processes involved in aging and degenerative disease are only 100% energy dependent and are accelerated by two interwoven states that decrease energy. And if I have time, I'll explain that. Uh, where's Phil? But I want to explain that triglyceride thing to you with the fructose because you're a little off on that. Um, by two interwoven states that cause us to, uh, to de have decreased energy. One is suboptimal oxygen consumption. I know this is true because I measure it in every crummy person I see. And I guarantee you that's true. The second is, was something that shocked me. This I didn't expect. Now, as you will see in a little bit when I kind of get into the dynamics of this test, 
it's possible for me to say, the human body can burn sugar or fat. We can't burn protein for energy, but we can burn sugar or fat for energy. Now that's an interesting thought right there. Why? We might have time to talk a little bit about why nature decided to let us burn gas and diesel instead of just one or the other. But we can burn sugar or fat for an energy substrate. I've always been taught that in fact what we burn is sugar. That's wrong. It's 100% wrong. The second part of this is that the substrate utilization shifts in a healthy human being. When you're 20 years old and you're a healthy athlete, and I measure your energy production, it's all coming from fat. All of it. Almost all of it. A little bit comes from sugar. As you get older, as you get sicker, as you get more and more out of shape, it becomes less and less from fat and more and more from carbs, more and more from sugar. Now that I've just said that, I bet half of you guys are starting to think, is that why we get fat as we get older? Is that why we get tired as we get older? Is that why we need carbs? Because we're shifting into a carb mode and we've got to feed that mode? And the answer is, yeah, you're thinking about the along the same lines that I am. So there's two reasons, and two reasons only in no-brainer medicine, that you get sick and you age and you feel lousy and you gain weight and you have chronic fatigue syndrome and you get arthritis and you sprain your ankle and it doesn't fix and you get cancer. Cancer fits right into this. There's only two reasons. One, you don't consume oxygen very well and two, you don't burn fat very well. That's what this is saying. And the corollary is by altering these two states to increase energy production, you get well, which is what I see all the time, and you don't get sick anymore. So, in my mind, there clearly is one disease, and it's decreased energy production. And it's measured by this test that I've developed, called bioenergy testing. Basically, what this test is, is we take FDA, well, I guess I'm going to get into that in a sec, so I won't, you know, over to my other slide. Um, we measure with bioenergy testing. So that's the disease, decreased energy production. We can measure it quantifiably, reliably, 100% of the time, measure it. And there's one treatment, increasing it. And you can monitor that, of course, by what you're doing. So all you guys are out there popping pills, you're running around, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're standing on your head, I don't know what the heck you're doing. But whatever you're doing, you don't know if it's working, do you? There's not one person in this room that can say to themselves, you know, other than my intuitive sensation, or other than this book I read that guaranteed me that that would lead me to the light. Well, there's a difference between feeling like shit and feeling good. Yeah, okay. That, that you're gonna okay, as you will see, you can't even rely on that, but that's a good point. <laughs> uh, you can feel great and everything is going down the tubes. You guys know that. You know, any doctor in here has seen a patient with stage 4 CA that felt great up until three weeks ago. I'll explain to you. I've got a great slide to explain this to you. But none of you know if what you're doing is having any positive effect at all. What I want to tell you is it's possible to know now. So if you want to just throw stuff at the wall and hope it sticks, or if you want to really know if it's sticking, it's possible now by measuring your energy production. Okay, you probably all know this. So this group seems like you probably knows this, but let's just go through it anyway. Aging's not the same as getting older. You know, when we use that term in a medical term, it refers to all the bad stuff that happens to you as you get older. I used to start off my lectures, you know, by asking, anybody here want to get old? And like, no hands. <laughs> and I'm saying, you know what? The alternative is yeah. you die young. I mean, is that what you want? No, but we think when we hear that word getting older, that means eh, decrepit and can't move and, you know, ate drugs and blue cross. That's our concept of getting older. That's aging. That's another deal. According to my good friend Ward Dean, I love this. Aging is the only disease everybody seems to get. It's a disease. It's just as treatable as chronic fatigue syndrome or anything else. It's called aging. While it's inevitable, 
and we all know that this is probably not going to be anywhere we're going to live forever. However, I fully intend to be absolutely totally functional until I'm 120, easily. And after that, I don't know. But this nonsense that we have about people that I see every day come into my office, well, of course I can hardly walk across the room. Doc, I'm 73. I'm old. You're aged. You're not old. Your maximum lifespan is somewhere between 120 and 140. When you're 70, you're about in midlife. You're not old. Aging is inevitable, but this rate and extent of aging that we see is absolutely ludicrous. And it's just on energy production. You want to stop aging, or at least slow it down, do some about energy production. So this is just a little slide. I took it from Ward's book on energy measurement. Um, just to point out, this is basically energy production levels. And this stuff is in the books. I didn't make this up. I just kind of put it together and figured out a way to measure it. And then started testing people, and from testing people, learned what works and what doesn't work. Um, and there you go. This is age, starting at age 30. It all goes down here. I've measured with your system. No, no, no. This is published data. Yeah, this is published data. This is, this is right here is a maximum oxygen uptake, which I'll explain to you in a second. It's the maximum oxygen your body can consume and it goes downhill from the age of 30. This is predictable. This is 100% predictable. There's not one of you, this won't happen in, unless you manage to be doing something to stop it. Energy production measurement is the most global parameter possible. Like I say, you know, you can look at cholesterol, you can look at blood levels, you can look at lean body mass. These are all good markers of aging, but they're all, all over the charts. Some people are aging like crazy and their vision's perfect. So all of this stuff is a little bit fuzzy here and there, except oxygen consumption. That's a slam dunk. That's 100% predictable. And that's why it's the ideal bioaging marker. Aerobic capacity. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit and explain this so you have a good sense of what I'm talking about uh, in a second. But to just remember that. But aerobic capacity is what we, one of the things that we measure. We get a lot of data from those two crummy little numbers. But aerobic capacity is the one we're interested in uh, because it's the ideal bioaging marker. Uh, other tests could be misleading, and I kind of was pointing that out, like the cholesterol levels, the blood pressures, the vision tests, the pactyl tests, all those, quote, biological study tests out there that are supposed to determine your biological age, they can be very misleading, and that's why nobody likes any of them. If you look at Ward's book, it's like that thick, and there's about 50 ideas in there huge, enormous, very interesting <coughs> algorithms, and the only problem with them is they don't work about 80, except about 80% of the time, the really good ones. Well, excuse me, 80% isn't enough for me to decide my life on. So this one happens to be 100%. It declines, like I said, linearly, regardless of training. So this kind of gets to the point you were talking about, what if I feel great? You know, I'm running marathons every other week. I've seen people who run marathons who are sick and lousy. And there's reasons for that. Namely, they're killing themselves in one way or another. Yeah. So, regardless of whether you're training, this is going to tell you the truth. That's the point I want to make. Nothing hides it. You can't band-aid it. You can't take a drug to make it look better. You can take a drug to lower your cholesterol, but you know darn well you're not making yourself live longer by taking that drug. And you can't take a drug to make your aerobic capacity better. You can only do one thing to make it better, and that's make your energy production better. And it's associated with all forms of cause mortality. So let me go into this article here, which was published a couple few years ago, which knocked my socks off when I saw it. Um, basically, it was a meta-analysis, which means these authors took all the studies that have ever been published on energy production, looked at what they all had in common, and did a study of the studies. That's a meta-analysis. We typically consider meta-analysis to be a very, very accurate portrayal of what's going on, more so than any one given study. Uh, these are just quotes from the article. Maximal aerobic capacity is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, cognitive dysfunction, and, you know, I could take this a little bit further because there's an abundance of the literature for Alzheimer's, all neurodegenerative diseases. Look up every one of them you're going to find energy uh, 
decrease in energy production associated with every disease from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's to Huntington's to ALS, every single one of them, that's what they manifest. So cardiovascular disease, cognitive dysfunction, all brain disorders, and literally all cause mortality. Anything you can possibly die of, this helps to cause it. And if you ask me, it's the main cause. Uh, other quote, although no change occurred in body composition with endurance trained men. So, you know, one of the classic and really good bioaging marker, by the way, is lean body mass. As we get older, we lose lean body mass. Why? Because it takes energy to make muscle. And we gain fat. Why? Because we're not burning it to make the energy that we need to put on the muscle. So there is this shift that takes place. And it's really, of all the bioaging markers, other than aerobic capacity, it's a good one. But you can get fooled. Because you can be like Jack Willane and pump iron all day long, or go out and run and do stuff, and maintain your uh, body composition numbers. But even if you do that, there's still going to be a significant decline in aerobic capacity. It's a perfect biomarker for aging. So let me explain to you a little bit there's two interesting things, like I see you get from this test. One is how well you convert oxygen to carbon dioxide, which literally tells you what your energy production is. It's like the speedometer on your car, if you will. And the other is whether you're burning fat to make that energy or burning glucose to make that energy. Now, here's how this works. When you burn glucose, it takes six oxygen atoms to burn one glucose. And as a result, you get six carbon dioxide atoms. You get a lot of ATP. The ratio of CO2 to O2, which is what I'm measuring, is 1. So when I give you this mouthpiece, and you're sucking on that, and you're just breathing on that, and that ratio comes out at 1, you're burning 100% carbs. Conversely, there's a little bit different ratio when you burn a fatty acid molecule. The ratio comes out to 0.7. So that ratio is pretty much always somewhere between 0.7 and 1. Now when you get above 1, you're anaerobic. Now you're making energy without oxygen. So I can learn an awful lot of really cool stuff by doing this test. I can tell you whether you're burning fat, or whether you're burning carbs, or whether you're anaerobic. And then it really starts to get interesting, because I do it with you sitting down resting. I do it with your jaw in various positions to see how your airway obstruction levels are. And then I start exercising you on a treadmill in a wrapped protocol and see how you do it over an exercise period. By the time I'm finished, the computer program, which I patented, takes all that breath-by-breath breath data, throws it into a bunch of algorithms, and then spits out some answers, which we'll kind of go over. But one of those answers is basically, I can tell whether you're burning fat or whether you're burning glucose. And that's how I came to learn about this glucose thing that we're talking about. Biological age. How old are you really? You don't have less energy from aging. You age because you have less energy. Chinese said it 3,000 years ago. I think they're onto something. <laughs> biological age is a much better predictor of disease than chronological age. What I'm here to tell you is if you're 35 years old and you have a biological age of 60, you've got the risk of a 60-year-older. Conversely, if you're like me and you're 59 and you have the biological age of 30, you've got the risk of a 30-year-older. That makes me kind of feel good. Because 30-year-olders, all i got to really watch out for is crossing the crosswalk. The rest of it's going to be taken from me. You're basically as old as your energy production. All right, this is it. This is the main deal right here. So this is, this is what you need to take off. Are you healthy or just not sick. How many people in here can tell me there's a test for health? And we got a test for health? Health meter? You've seen the latest health meter? There isn't one. There isn't one test of health. There's only tests for disease or diseases. There's a test for health. Here's why. Because until you get diseased and get over to this area, nothing really happens. As you were pointing out, you feel good. 
but we know darn well that somewhere between being really perfectly optimally healthy and getting cancer, there's this zone in here where you feel great, everything's lovely, you think you're in top-notch shape, and you're not. You're steadily getting sicker over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I document this, so I know this is what's going on. And this is what's happening. So let's, this is maximum energy production. For those of you know, who know what VO2 max is, that's what VO2 max is. It's the maximum amount of energy your body can make. To determine that, we put you on the bicycle and we make you run it as hard as you possibly can until you just flat out give up. We measure your energy production, that's your maximum energy. Now, actually, on the test, I don't do that because it's not important. Maximum energy production is unimportant, and I'll tell you why. You can be healthy, and you can be unhealthy and have the same maximum energy production. <clears throat> that's key. That's really key. Because a lot of people think because they can produce the same energy, they can still ride their bicycle up, a, up the mountain in 45 minutes or whatever their way of determining their energy production is. They think that means I'm still... I'm still as healthy as I once was because I can do this. Uh-uh. It's not, the, the part about being unhealthy is not where you get to you can't make as much energy, it's where you get to how you make the energy. And that's why bioenergy testing is in fact a health meter, because I can tell you that. So let's, let's break down that. There's three ways you and I can make energy. Now remember, I, I, I told you, we can burn fat, we can burn glucose, what's, a, what's with that? How come, how come God made a car that can burn diesel and burn gas? What's with that? Anybody got a car that can burn diesel and gas? Doesn't seem to make much sense, seems like a waste. What is the reason for us to burn two things at once? Well, let's look at this for a second. You can make lots of energy from fat, but what do you need to make energy from fat? You need to breathe, you've got to have oxygen. You can't make energy from fat without oxygen. So, if I'm evolving, I think I am, but I've gotten past at least the fat to carbohydrate ratio. If I'm an evolving human being, and I realize that anything that cuts off my air supply kills me in 30 seconds after I've used up my available oxygen in the bloodstream, I gotta evolve something else. I gotta evolve something that gives me a little more emergency time to get to breathing again. If I'm drowning, an animal's got me by the throat, whatever. So Mother Nature evolved burning carbs. Because what can you do with carbs? You can burn glucose with oxygen, and you can also burn glucose without oxygen. You can hold your breath, if you're really good at this anaerobic stuff, you can hold your breath for three, four minutes. In fact, there's this one diver that I was in a free diver. He could hold his breath for six minutes and not die. And I'm here to tell you, if you didn't have, if you didn't have this capability for carbohydrate, you'd die in 30 seconds. So this is why. They, well, that doesn't quite answer the question, though. Then why didn't Mother Nature say, "Well, okay, the heck with that. Let's just burn sugar." Let's, let's evolve human beings that just burn sugar. And incidentally, she's busy doing that right now as we speak. We have a whole generation of people that are now evolving the ability to burn only sugar. Forget that. Okay? Uh, but why would she decide, well, let's burn fat? It's very simple. You can't store much sugar. It's not very storable. It's a very poor way to store things. Fat is a highly condensed molecule. And you can store a lot of fat in a little wallop. You guys know this because you know the calorie books. But then you can sugar. So it's not efficient. So that's why we've got two energy sources. We've got fat because it's efficient. We can store plenty of it. Everything's great. And we've got carbs for emergencies. How do I know carbs for emergencies? You can't store much. If you couldn't burn your fat supply and you had to live off your carb supply, you'd be dead in an hour. And maybe two hours, depending on, you know what your glycogen storage capacity was. But you couldn't live very long. Unfortunately, when you're sick, you're living here. When you're well, you're living down here. So this is what happens. Three ways you can make energy. You make it from fat. So while you guys are sitting there right now, 
you should be burning approximately 98% of all your energy from fat. How many here have heard the story that the brain can only metabolize glucose? I'm mean, serious, raise your hand. The brain can only, okay, okay, okay. That's not true. That is not true. There have published studies of Maasai who don't eat any carbs at all, literally. They eat meat and fat, period. Not one leaf crosses those lips. And their brains burn fat as an energy substrate. We burn carbohydrate as an energy substrate because that's what we're feeding the virus. But when you guys are sitting there right now, you should be burning nothing, almost nothing, but fat. There should be very little carb where you're burning it. But I'll guarantee you, a lot of you are right in here or over in here. And what happens with fat metabolism is it goes down. And you don't know it. All you know is you've got the same amount of energy you had before. You don't know you're making a, you don't have a fat meter. So you don't know if you're making from fat or carbs. I know, because I can see your carbon dioxide to oxygen ratios. But you don't know. Now you might sort of get a little whiff of this thinking, you know what? I'm starting to put fat on. You know, I'm having a little trouble getting this fat off me. You might have noticed that. But even if you're a skinny guy like me, you could still be living off carbs. Okay, so basically three ways you can make. When you're healthy, you can exercise to your maximum potential, and almost all of the energy that you require to do that is aerobic, made from oxygen, very little anaerobic. Now, why is that good? Well, look at this scenario. There's a number of good things. Number one, when you burn fat, there's much less acid production. Now, probably everybody, all you guys know that one of the things that makes us sick as we get older is acid accumulation in the body. And what people have told you, the same thing used to tell me, still do, I guess, that all that acid comes from the food you eat, which is absolute utter hogwash. If you look at the physiology test, guarantee you the amount of acid residue that comes from the foods you eat is no more than one hundredth the amount of acid that comes from respiration. We are acid producers. Whenever we take oxygen in, it's an alkaline atom, we produce an acid atom called carbon dioxide. And the more carbon dioxide we produce, the more acid in our bodies. And that's a hundred times more powerful than if you ate nothing but T-bones for the rest of your life. The, the food connection with acid is very minimal on this. You get acid because you make acid. Except when you burn fat, you make very little. When you burn glucose, you make two, three times more acid for the same ATP molecule that you generate. That's because you produce more carbon dioxide with glucose. Remember we saw that thing? The oxygen carbon dioxide ratio is higher with glucose by a factor of 30%. So you burn, you make more acid from glucose. That's another reason Mother Nature didn't want you living off glucose. You can't store it, it makes a hell of a lot more acid. And if you lived off nothing but glucose, you'd be one walk in acid. So, what we want to do is we want to make the bulk of our energy from fat. We want to make, obviously, some energy from carbohydrate, <coughs> oxygen, and we want to make very little energy anaerobically. And that's going to compose our entire energy output. Because when you get anaerobic, folks, now, I told you that you're producing 30% more acid with carbs than over fat. You get anaerobic the numbers jumped up to 18 times more acid. 18 times more acid to make a molecule of ATP anaerobically than to make the same molecule aerobically. Not a good deal, okay? So you don't want to do this too much. When you're unhealthy, here's what happens. You're over here, okay? Now what EQ means, this, this is the measurement I use on the test. I call it energy quotient. It's like you want to have a high IQ, you want to have a high EQ too. That's how much energy you can make. So, on the test, when your energy quotient is over 100, here's where you are. When your energy quotient is less than that, here's where you are. You're producing more and more of your energy anaerobically. You, like I said, you still may be functioning just as good as you ever did. But more of it's coming anaerobically. The amount of aerobic is pretty much the same, unless your mitochondria is screwed up. Now, if your mitochondria is screwed up from toxicity, 
or heavy metals. Um, there's a bunch of ways mitochondria can get screwed up and poisoned. But if they're screwed up by any of that, then this right here is smaller than that. But in this particular case, I'm just still showing you pure aging, the effect of pure aging got nothing to do with any toxicity. You never had a styrofoam cup in your life here. And your fat metabolism, and the reason your total energy is reduced is because fat is reduced. You stop burning fat efficiently. But you feel great. Everything's wonderful. But on the health meter, you're scoring somewhere less than 100. Then, of course, this is when most people come and go see the doctor. They're hugely anaerobic. Now, somebody here earlier early was saying that my daughter has chronic fatigue syndrome. Do you, have any, do you know what to do about that? Yeah, slightly. So it's sort of like that's what most doctors do. patients who are sitting in that chair right now are anaerobic. I know you don't believe that. I know you think that's hogwash. How can that possibly be? They're anaerobic. That's the way they live. If you ran a marathon tomorrow, you wouldn't go see your doctor the day after tomorrow and say, geez, I feel all achy and I feel bad. Would you? This is more or less normal. Gosh, you ran a marathon. What do you expect? If you're a chronic fatigue, you go see him. Because walking across this room is like a marathon. You live in anaerobic production. You are so loaded with lactic acid, you don't even know about it. That's where they live. You correct their energy metabolism, get it like this, bingo. They don't have chronic energy anymore. That's the end of the story. All right, so I'm going to kind of skip along here. Some of this may be a little confusing, but I've saved time for questions. Yeah? What's the unit of energy that you use? Okay, the question is, what's the unit of energy? And it's cc's of oxygen consumed. That's what I'm measuring. But that's not physical. What's the physical energy? That's what I'm measuring. Then I take that data and translate it out into something like EQ, something that people can use and understand. But the, what I'm measuring is millimeters of oxygen being consumed per unit of time. And I'm looking at that as the ratio of carbon dioxide. Probably from a physics standpoint, it's not perfect. Mark Twain is like, he's always got good things going on. you got to love Mark Twain. <laughs> he's got some of the best quotes. I love this guy. Okay. Um, this is a, a study that's soon to appear in one of the journals. I don't know which one. Submitted it to a few, but I have no idea which one. But uh, are your patients exercising too hard to be healthy is the title of the article. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We can talk about it more a little later. Here's the bottom line. There's two kinds of... Now, everybody pretty much knows that exercise is good for you. Doesn't mean they do it. But it means they know it's good for you. So there's basically two kinds of people in this world. Democrats, no. There's two kinds of people in this world. There's people who don't exercise. They're usually the Democrats. And people who exercise. That's the two kinds of people. People who don't, people who do, okay? What I want to tell you is they're both doing it wrong, pretty much. The ones that don't exercise clearly are wrong. And the ones that do exercise are doing it too hard. The ones that exercise, they have the audacity to think that they... Oh, skate. Thank you. They have the audacity to think they're here. <laughs> they think they're here when they're here. And they exercise at this level, which would be perfect for them. They're there, but they're over here. What this study basically shows is that people who exercise think they're in better shape than they really are. Uh, and let's, let's just kind of run through this real quick, like I don't want to exhaust this, but ATR on the test is your anaerobic threshold heart rate. So we can measure what your heart rate is when you cross over to anaerobic metabolism. 
and that's your heart rate. And, and uh, you don't want to go above that heart rate. So that's what that is. Uh, now, if you go to see a fitness instructor, a lot of times they say, well, I'll tell you what your ATR is. Your ATR is, you take 220, you subtract your age, and multiply that by 0.8 or 0.85, depending on who you like to read, and that's your ATR. That's just great if, you know, we we're all exact same model of before. But guess what? There's a whole lot of variation here. Some people are out of shape, some people are in shape, some people are old, some people are big, some people are some people have slightly different genetics than other people have. So that formula was what I tested. How accurate is that formula that you guys use to determine how you should exercise? Since you don't know that you're not healthy, you're assuming that you are healthy and you're using this formula. Well, how accurate is that formula? Turns out it's not accurate at all. Um, exercise, well, geez, this just tells you what happens when you don't exercise. But this, what the study showed is that out of 20 randomly selected people that I checked to see where their ATRs were compared to the formula, 18 of them were all, an, all, 18 of them were all anaerobic every time they exercised. The only up two that weren't anaerobic were exercising way below their potential. They happened to be athletes. So um, basically exercise is good. Exercising at your ATR maximizes when you're right up at that I wish I could do this, but when you're right up at this zone, right when you're right there, you're exercising right there, that's your maximum. That's where you want to be. But if you don't know where that is, you don't know where your maximum is. So you might be down here, taking it way too easy, like two of those people were, or you'd be like the other 18, way up here, all anaerobic, killing themselves, trying to be healthy. Um, what happens when you go above that to anaerobic land? Um, you exhaust your pH buffering system. You make so much acid, maybe 18 times the acid that you make normally to get one energy, plus you're cranking out energy like crazy when you're exercising. You're like loading your body with 150 T-bones. You've got so much acid in your system it doesn't know what to do with it. You totally exhaust your pH buffering systems. You totally exhaust your antioxidant buffering systems. You better be sucking down a lot of vitamin C. Because you're busy destroying yourself instead of helping yourself. And it's pretty ironic. Okay, uh, we'll go through a couple more slides and then uh, we'll go into some case presentations. Energy production can be used to distinguish between the chronic fatigue from the all too common. I just don't see it. Nobody's got energy, I see. Like nobody. Even the people who think they have energy don't have energy. Now, men are really good about this. Women will tell you, yeah, I'm tired or run down. But you ask a guy, how do you feel? I feel great. <laughs> well, how's the sex life? That's it's great. It's fabulous. Good. No problem. How is it compared to like 10 years ago? I said, oh, my God, are you crazy? <laughs> so, you know, men, we have a real good attitude about things, and everything's just beautiful. But if you ask us, how are you functioning compared to 10 or 15 years ago? then you have a little better assessment as to what's going on, sort of a mini bioenergy test. Um, but some people, a lot of people come and tell me, I'm tired of run down, I do the bioenergy test on them. They're cranking out energy beautifully. I see this a lot. What's that all about? They're mental. About 20% of the people they have chronic fatigue syndrome, are just mental cases. You know, they're depressed. We know that depression is a, a hallmark of depression is fatigue. But 80% of them aren't. 80% of them got a serious energy deficit disorder. And the cool news is that you can, like, give those people that 20%, the, the mental cases, you can give them vitamin B12 and anything you want all day long, and they're not going to get better. Because you don't even know what you're treating you think you're treating a low energy state because they complain about that. But I'm just pointing this out because it's a, it's, 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 it can be confusing to a practitioner. The doctors in here know what I'm talking about. Okay, trying to, dis, trying to distinguish your mental problems from your physical problems. Improving energy production improves the cl clinical outcome of basically every disease there is. So if you're in the market for, for preventing a disease, improving your energy output is a good way to do it. Uh, I'll skip this slide. Uh, okay, who should be tested? Anybody who doesn't want to, know, want to live long? You know? uh, this is one of my favorite questions is, 
patient come in to see you, you test their energy, it's lousy, they have this light, this list of symptoms. You say, okay, because of all this stuff, you need this, this, this. They go take all this stuff, and they say, I gotta do that. Yeah, you gotta get eight hours of sleep. Yeah, you gotta go Sunday. That should be easy. The sleep in the Sunday part should be easy, okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah, you gotta drink water. Now that's pushing me, even though water's free. But you have gotta drink water. But you start getting down to the supplement part. My God, I'm spending 70 bucks a month on supplements. You know? What's that Lexus out there? Uh, I'm 70 bucks a month on supplements. Woo! Baby! All right. And I've got to exercise. Oh my God. Now we're really pushing them over the line. Okay? So they come back in three months. We measure their energy production. It's awesome. They feel like a million bucks. What's the first thing they say? You guys know. What's the first thing they say? Do I have to keep doing this? Do I have to keep doing this? The doctors are laughing because you guys know what I'm talking about. The answer is no, you don't. You want to feel like you used to, you can stop it. Anyhow, who should, do, who, who should use this test? Only those people that care about being well and not aging. I will tell you the measurements are clinically valuable even in cases of stage 4 cancer. So they're really helpful, not just from a prevention mode, but patients with cancer, out of 100 patients with cancer, probably maybe 8 to 9 die from the cancer. You know, the cancer eats a hole in something or, you know, kills them or something like that. The other 90% get wasted away. They just die from fatigue and their body becomes physically exhausted. So you just take a stage 4 cancer patient, bump their energy levels up to a, that of a healthy person, you're not only increasing the odds they'll go into a remission, of course, but you'll keep them healthier a lot longer because there are basically very few patients with active cancer. I have patients with serious stage 4 cancer that I've been treating for up to 5 years now. And they're their oncologists don't know why they're still alive. I know, because they're making energy. But from a, and the cancer is all over the place. Um, you know, all this stuff, hepatitis, whatever it is, the outcome of all diseases is improved by the enhancement energy. So this is just not something that you can use if you're well and want to stay well. So that's the uh, doctor of the future. We'll give no medicine, but we'll interest in his patients in the care of the human frame and diet that cause prevention of disease. Thomas Edison is supposed to be one of the all-time geniuses of the 20th century. Uh, he said this in the 1930s. You know, maybe 100 years later, people will start to appre appreciate, maybe the medical establishment will start to appreciate a little bit of the wisdom behind those words. Um, bioenergy testing based is this. It's this equipment. You can go out and buy it. It's in your hospitals, by the way. A lot of your pulmonary physicians have this equipment. In medicine, they use this oxygen carbon dioxide analysis to determine if you have heart disease, if you're a good candidate for a transplant, to find out if you have lung disease, if so, what kind of lung disease you have, stuff like that. Of course, nobody uses it to see if you're healthy or not. That was my idea. But these, this piece of equipment is FDA certified, proof equipment, it's a bomb proof. It's, we're not talking somebody made this in a garage, okay? This is good stuff. All, all I did was take the data have to develop a computer program that can collect it and then throw it through algorithms and give you some printouts. <clears throat> so let me show you some printouts. And give you an idea how this is. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, don't do that. Okay. All right, I didn't. on at the very parts of the body, get rid of back pain, blah, blah, blah. And the third day is on bioenergy test. We do a whole day of that. And I get right down into the actual chemical equations. And then we talk a lot about what you do about it, which I haven't talked about all night. Can you talk about that a little bit? Huh? Can talk about that a little bit? Well, yes. I'll talk as long as you want to stay. I'm cool. My energy is not too bad right now. Okay, so anyhow, these are available if you are interested or you think your doc might be interested. All right, so let's throw one up here. These are 
These are just ones I did the other day. Let's see here. Uh, nobody can probably see that that well, huh? Uh, can we tip the lights just a pinch? So the other day, uh, this is a woman. Uh, here's her blood pressure data. She's 55 years old. She weighs 143 pounds. She's five foot one. So that's just your basic data there. This is what the test tells you. It tells me her resting heart rate is 97. Something wrong with that? Resting heart rate, 97. Something's definitely wrong. What could possibly be wrong with the one with the resting heart rate of 97? Well, one thing that could be wrong is your doctor could be giving her too much thyroid. You see that a lot. Thyroid will increase your energy level. So, but you can use it as a band-aid in the same way that coffee will increase your energy level. You know, if I do this energy test, we've done this, give somebody a cup of coffee, redo it, it looks a lot better. Okay? But that's a band-aid. That's not really changed anything physiologically. Same with thyroid. There's a lot of thyroid abuse out there with some physicians. So this could be that. That's the first thing I think of when I see that. Or they're hyperthyroid. That could be. But let's slip right down here and go to M factor. M is uh, one of the readings that we get when the patient's at rest. It tells us what their basal metabolism is at rest. It's a, it's a number that I equate with 100. If it's 100, between 120, that's pretty good resting metabolism. Okay? In this case, it's 100. So it's not probably hyperthyroidism that's causing that heart rate to go up. What could cause that heart rate to go up? Let's skip down here to heart factor. One of the interesting things you can do by knowing what the oxygen consumption rates are on a patient is figure out their cardiac output. Uh, physicians know about this, but what that means is how much blood your heart can pump out with each stroke. Now, there's a formula called the FIC formula that we can use, and the computer uses that formula. It depends on one, it assumes you have a normal hemoglobin. So if your patient is anemic, this it won't work. This lady's not anemic, though. And it assumes that you don't have any pulmonary disease. She didn't have any pulmonary disease, uh, as evidenced by her lung factor, which is actually quite good. So this is a pretty good measurement, then, of her cardiac output. Look at it. It's horrible. It wants to be at least 161 is really bad. I mean, that's like a 90-year-old person's heart. It's really bad. So that's why her heart's beating so fast. It has to beat fast, because she, she's in lousy shape. She's either got a cardiomyopathy, literally something wrong with her heart, or uh, she's just remarkably out of shape. Uh, we look at the breathing rate as people become anxious and anxiety disorders, and the book gets into this. They enhance their breathing rate. There's the old yoga thing with diaphragmatic versus chest wall breathing. What we have found out is that chest wall breathing is a really good way to knock down your energy production numbers. And so uh, we will look at this thing called a breathing factor, which looks at the mm -hmm. last phase of your breath, the carbon dioxide percentage of the last phase of your breath. And we will look at a uh, resting respiratory rate. And between those two, we can tend to figure out if they're breathing improperly. And if they are, one of the first things my tech starts teaching them is how to breathe diaphragmatically. And I go into the book about a whole deal like that. So breathing is one of the things that doesn't cost you anything, and yes, you have to do it the rest of your life. <laughs> um, adrenal factor. <laughs> you know, if your adrenal were good, you wouldn't come see me. That's the end of the story. So, you know, it's like, how do I diagnose if my, pain, my patient has a bad adrenal? They're in my office. That's the diagnosis. All right, so 100% of my patients have adrenal dysfunction. That's not the issue. The issue is, how am I going to treat it? If it's really, really bad, I'm going to give them hydrocortisone, I'm going to give them DHEA, I'm going to give them licorice, and there's this whole stick full of stuff that I do. Yes? Are these numbers all coming from measuring the gases going in and out? Or is no. Mixed no. Good question. No. Uh, you know, obviously, heart rate is, yeah. you know, the, you the, ones that, the ones that actually look at that are the heart function, the lung function, fitness factor, M factor, C factor, energy quotient, fat burning factor, biological age. So this is the oxygen stuff down here. The adrenal factor basically comes from an orthostatic blood pressure difference. This is just some extra information that I can put in. The physician can look at it real quick and get an idea how bad is this patient's adrenal. And in her case, not too bad. Not a big, not a big deal. So far, the only thing that's 
I'm impressed with what this patient is. Man, she's got some going on with this heart. This is pathetic. Lungs are great. Lungs are beautiful. Ideal weight. Let me see. She's uh, you know about 10 pounds overweight. Uh, we use a, a bioimpedance body fat measuring device. I've tried 18 zillion kinds of measuring devices for body fat. Body fat. The only one that's halfway reasonable is a bioimpedance, and even that isn't perfect. But forget the calipers; they're basically useless. Uh, okay, then fitness factor. Okay, so what fitness factor is? We're taking the patient up to that anaerobic point, just where they start to get anaerobic. And we got them on a bicycle, and we're seeing how forcefully they're turning the pedals. Now, how much power do they have in their legs? So this is a measurement of muscle strength, muscle power. Sarcopenia, the loss of muscle tissue, is a hallmark of aging. Thighs are your biggest muscle. That's where you'll find it the most. So it's a really good measurement of strength and whether or not you've got sarcopenia. Uh, we use formulas based upon existing databases. You know, so I know that a six foot one, 230 pound man should be generating this much power on the ergometer when he reaches this point, blah, blah, blah. And that's what fitness factor is. She ain't got no muscle. Everything's supposed to be 100 here on this scale. Scale it all to 100. She has no muscle. Well, what's the heart? Dang muscle. This, this lady, I can tell you right now, 55 year old lady, she's in a whole lot of hurt. And she has lost muscle mass. Why has she lost muscle mass? It takes energy to make muscle. It takes energy to make hormones. It takes energy to think that you need to have energy. It takes energy to do any crummy thing you want. If you look down here at her EQ, so we'll skip around all that, 75, that's pathetic. That's really bad for a 55-year-old person. That gives her a biological age, I'll tell you what that means in a second, of 78 years old. So, if she were, what that means is if she were 78, she wouldn't be seeing me. She'd be thinking, yeah, this is how I'm supposed to be. Everything's cool. But I'm 55. I'm not supposed to be like that. And she is. She's, her body's acting like a 78-year-old body. I'll tell you how I get this in a second. But one of the main things we figured out so far is she's lost all her muscle mass. She's losing muscle mass in her heart and everything. Something really screwy going on here. Metabolism, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Now, there's two main reasons your metabolism is going to fall down. That's your thyroid, which is a problem in like 90% of 55 year olders. I don't know how come she's doing so well, but uh, she's not in that case. Uh, or adrenals. And so, for some bizarre reason, this lady's thyroid and adrenals are working okay. All right, let's uh, then, so that's metabolism, or metabolism's okay. So far, I've got a lot of useful information as a biological physician that I can use. I haven't even gotten the good part yet. Uh, next is C-factor. This is my favorite number of all of them. Well, these two, C-factor and fat-burning factor. This is a measurement of how much fat she's burning at rest. This is a measurement of how much fat she's burning when she, maximal fat she can burn during exertion. That's what those are. So, C factor tells you, you're just sitting there right now, you're at rest, how much fat you're burning at rest. As I told you, it should be a, a whole lot. So, her C factor is 87. That's actually not bad. You know, mostly I see C factors like 50 and 60. Okay? Meaning that they're sitting there and they're bathing most of their energy from carbohydrate stores, not from fat. So, 87, yeah, she's getting too much from carbs. But not altogether that bad. Why do I call it C-factor instead of resting fat burning factor? Why do I call that? C stands for carbohydrate. What I have discovered, this quite to my surprise, I didn't know I was going to find this out. There is nothing that suppresses your resting fat metabolism more than eating carbohydrate. So, after five, six years of doing this, folks, I take all carbohydrates and I put them into the same category as chocolate cake. Your oranges, your apples, your blueberries, your bread, your potatoes, every crummy little carbohydrate you like, in my world, that's chocolate cake. They taste good, they're fun, you really like to eat them, I don't know what it is about them, but you like them. And just like chocolate cake. When I eat chocolate cake, I'm not sitting there saying, boy, 
I'm going to be, this is going to help me. I'm eating some chocolate cake, yeah. I'm going to have high energy. I don't say that because I know when I eat carbs, it lowers my energy just like chocolate cake. So let me give you the carbohydrate spiel I give my patients because this goes against everything you guys could possibly think of, doesn't it? This is absolute total heresy. There are eight essential proteins. Well, all the only foods you can eat are just three. I mean, everything that you eat breaks down into three components, protein, fat, carbohydrate, right? Okay, there's and eight. Micronutrients. Right? And micronutrients, four. What's a micronutrient? What do you mean? Yeah, vitamins. And oh, okay, vitamins, I mean substrates. Yeah. Substrates, things your body's made out of, okay? Um, there's only three, those. Okay, so there's eight essential proteins. That designation means your body can't make them. You better eat them. They're essential to your life. You don't eat all eight of those proteins, you die. They're essential. There are two essential fats. Same principle. You don't eat those fats, you die. How many essential carbs are there? Zero. Thank you. There aren't any. There aren't any essential carbohydrates. This has been proven, incidentally. I'm not making this up. There aren't any essential carbohydrates. You can live your entire life and marry a carbohydrate past those lips of yours and be perfectly healthy. In fact, you'll be healthier than you are now. That's what I've learned. And if I had to tell you one thing that's killing you, besides not getting enough sleep, not getting enough water, not getting enough sun, loading yourself up with toxins and all the other stuff that you all know about, on the top of that list, is you're eating carbs, and you're thinking it's healthy, and guess what? It's not. All I ever do all day long is look at these numbers, and I, I never see one that's good, except once I've been working on them. Once they've got it through their skull, not eat carbs anymore, then they come back, and I'm seeing hundreds, hundreds of fives. You're going to say, I think the next one I got in here is a really bad one. This actually is not too bad. Okay. So basically, the treatment here is to take her off carbs. Now, when you exercise and you look in your exercise capacity for burning fat, that's not so influenced by carbs. We've seen people that have a horrible C factor at resting; they're burning fat. You exercise them, and they're resting; they're burning their carbs. You exercise them, they actually start kicking in a little fat. Okay. So this over here looks at the fat burning cofactors a little bit more: L-carnitine. Niacin. I can't tell you how much action you can get off L-carnitine and niacin. Those two are absolutely astounding. Lipoic acid. Those three. You and that's what I put my patients on. They got low fat burning factor, and hers isn't all that bad. But I'm going to put her on it anyway because what's muscle made out of? You know, carnitine is a big player there. Okay, so I'm going to put her on all these kinds of things that build her up. I put her on amino acids. A lot of amino acids. If you're eating carbs, what aren't you eating? Protein. Most of you guys don't eat enough protein. Not even close to it. You eat too much, but you don't eat enough protein. And if you do eat protein, it's not the good stuff. You want to get protein with eight essential proteins in it. That's meat, eggs, or dairy. It's of an animal origin. So if you're vegetarian, you're not getting essential proteins. Maybe if you like got a mathematical formula and you figure stuff out, you could do it. In my entire career of doing this test for seven years on literally hundreds of people, I've seen two vegans that test out great. I can tell you what their names are, because it just astounded me. One guy comes from Hawaii, and I swear to God, he's a vegan, and he is one healthy son of a gun. And the other one is an Asian from San Francisco, and she's one healthy heck of a healthy woman. And, uh, the whole, the rest of the vegans and so-called vegetarians, and these guys, those two, you know what they had in common? They were like scientific about it. They were obsessive about it, which has made me think that's almost what you got to be. If you decide you're going to be a vegan, number one, you better have the right genetics, and number two, you better be obsessive. And if you can combine those two, you'll be like these two, because every other one I, every other one I tested was like, their biological age was like this one. I mean, horrible. Um, and then, okay, let me tell you a little bit about biological age, how we get that. Biological age is skewed on all these factors. It's skewed on your resting metabolism, 
on your resting fat metabolism, on your exertional fat metabolism, on your overall energy quotient, the maximum aerobic capacity. This is aerobic capacity, by the way. It's the maximum oxygen uh, that you can absorb before you start going to anaerobic metabolism. It combines all of those, but it weights energy quotient twice. So it's a, you got to have all your ducks in a row to have a really good biological age, to get a biological. Now, I arbitrarily sort of decided that about the healthiest time you're going to ever have in your life is somewhere between 35 and 40. That's when you filled out, you've maxed out, you're at your maximum power, maximum speed. Now, not maybe from a super athlete's perspective, that's different, but from an over just being healthy perspective, somewhere between 30 and 40. So the designation we use here is 40. Everything is based upon the age of 40. So I don't care how old she's 55 years old, I don't care how old she is, I'm comparing her to a 40-year-old woman, her weight, what not actually her weight. I'll make this a little difference. We compute what her weight would be were she not obese. Basically, if this woman, because I don't want to let that fat kind of prejudice the test, the test against her. So we assume, what if she didn't have that extra 20 pounds on her body? It was lipo. What would she, how would she test? And so the equations are based upon a person with a normal body fat percentage, but otherwise the same characteristics, height and sex and age. And, um, and 40 years old. I defaulted to 40 if they're older than 40. If they're younger than 40, it's defaulted to their age. And that's how those numbers come out. All right, okay, yeah. Then lastly, you know, what do doctors do? They tell you, you guys have seen doctors going in, they tell you, yeah, you got exercise, thanks a lot, bye. Out you go, I got exercise, I got exercise. They don't tell you what to do. They just tell you you got exercise. We tell you what to do. And um, we actually give you some parameters. That's where you're burning maximum amount of fat. That's fat burning heart rate. This is where you're starting to get anaerobic. You better be in between those two. The best form of exercise is where you're spending, and this is just what I've discovered that's not published, but this is what I've discovered by trial and error. You spend about three minutes at FBR. That's pretty easy. FBR, you could be talking to somebody on the phone. They probably wouldn't know that you're exercising. It's pretty easy. Uh, uh, three minutes at FBR, one minute at ATR. So you're walking down the road at a nice brisk clip for about three minutes, and then you bust into a run for a minute. Drive your heart rate up to the top end. In this case, uh, 160. And uh, leave it there for a minute, slow down to a nice walk. Go again. You get infinitely more out of your exercise if you challenge, relax, challenge, relax. You know, it's so simple if you stop. Think about it. When you're lifting a weight, you do this, right? You don't do this. What good is that for your muscle? You got to tear it, relax it, let it recover. Tear it, relax it, then it responds. And that's what you want to do when you do your training. So we actually give them a program. We say, well, you need to do this three days, you need to do it this way, blah, blah, blah. Let me kind of come up here to this before we go. This is, this is a really good little thing. Now, this is another thing I discovered that's quite fascinating. Uh, you know, there are data tables. You can go and you can look up your sex, height, weight, and age, and it'll tell you what amount of calories you should be eating. Okay? What I've learned is that that is only completely erroneous. That always overestimated by at least 30%, usually 50%. So if the tables say you should be eating 2,500 calories, like it says for me, I mean, I test out at 1,500. Not anywhere close at that. Because what we can do, of course, I'm looking at your energy production. I know how many calories you burn. I know how many calories you burn when you're exercising, and what, at what stage of exercise. And I know how many calories you're burning just sitting there doing nothing. So if I tell you to exercise at such and such, here's your schedule. You're 30 minutes a day, and you're spending 20% of your time exercising at this parameter, 50. I can compute all that. The computer computes all that. So that's what this tells you. So basically. If you take the optimum caloric intake for fat loss, that represents 500 calories less than her daily caloric needs. That makes sense because if you don't eat as, if you're burning 500 calories more than you're eating, you lose one pound a week. That's what we would like to do. Okay, so that's what that means. I can tell you right now that her daily caloric need 
is 1681. So if she does this, plus corrects all these other factors, and in this case her metabolism is okay, but she's got to cut out some carbs, take some stuff to burn fat a little bit better, uh, do the exercise, this is based upon 30 minutes, six days a week. Those numbers all come out, she lose a pound of fat a week. That's a guarantee. That's, that's just a slam dunk. Because uh, I'm not guessing. I'm not like putting out some kind of table and saying we ought to do this. So I never miss. Now this is, this is my favorite, the optimum caloric intake longevity. In this case, it's slightly higher. What this means is I'm uh, using uh, the principle of calorie restriction. Now, in calorie restriction studies, they take animals uh, and they give them 40% calorie restriction. They live in the order 15 to 20% longer. The lifespan is 15 to 20% longer. They've tried to do this experiment on humans, but not a whole lot of humans are going to stay on 40% calorie restriction. It just doesn't seem to work out, so they don't do it. Uh, based upon my observation, it's not so much the total amount of calories you eat anyway, it's the kind of calories you eat. So most of those calories are protein, i.e. not energy substrate. And you only restrict the calories 20%. And I have some data to back me up on this. You should get the same effect. Of course, nobody knows because you know, nobody's taking any human beings and stuck them away for 80 years to see what happens. But so what this number tells you, that's the number you want to stay at for the rest of your life. This is the number you want to stay at if you need to lose weight. This woman should, for the rest of her life, all things being the same, nothing changing now, should consume no more than 1,322 calories uh, a day. There's two mistakes Americans make with diet. As far as I'm concerned, only two mistakes. One, they eat carbohydrate, and two, they flat out eat too much. I don't care what they're eating. Even if they're on Atkins, they eat too much. Uh, okay, so let's... Oh, uh, yeah, this is the second sheet of that report. This, by the way, the patients get a big old long-winded report. This is just what the doctor sees. It's pretty much of a summary report. Patients get a big 15-page printout that explains all this stuff to them. So when they come back and see the doctor, they've got all this info and this stuff that I'm telling them and then doesn't, isn't all grief. It's not the first time they're hearing it. This is what the doctor sees. So basically kind of goes through all that stuff I just told you. More or less the computer's able to pick up stuff and, and tell, you, tell the doctor you know, what he ought to do. By the way, if any of you um, are physicians or are interested in having this test in your office, let me know. If uh, any of you think that your physician would be interested in having this test in his office, let me know. We now have testing centers in Las Vegas, Seattle, the Bay Area, Walnut Creek, Los Angeles. Two more due to go in Los Angeles. For some reason, people in Los Angeles are really interested in this. And, uh, and then one in Singapore. One going in in Taiwan, so we're taking over the uh, Qi market too. <laughs> it's been on the market now for about 10 months. Okay, uh, let's look at this. <coughs> I didn't get the data on him. All right, so this is a man, yeah. Okay, so this is the other day. This is a 50 year old guy. Let's look, see how he's doing. He doesn't weigh very much, 138 pounds, 67, and I know this guy. He's actually an excellent exercise. This guy's a health nut. A really good guy. Very nice man. Okay, uh, resting heart rate, 44. Yeah, he's exercising not told you. So he's got a very low resting heart rate. What's his heart factor? 135. Man's got a heart like Lance Armstrong or something. He's ready to go. And he gets that because he takes good care of himself. Resting respiratory rate, 9. Breathing factor's a little high because he was a little uptight with that thing in his mouth. That, That'll make a lot of people uptight. They get a little claustrophobic with a deal and then with a little clip on your nose. And you know, looking at ah, they get a little uptight. Breathing factor looks at whether you're breathing in a way that's sort of hyperventilating. He was doing that, but he was controlling it real nice because he meditates, so he knows how to do that. His lung uh, factor wasn't all that great either. Now, this man never smoked, he doesn't have any history of lung disease. I don't know what the deal why his, you would expect him to have a huge lung capacity, but some people are just genetically born that way. But it's interesting to know that there's something going on with his lungs that is probably genetic in origin, probably what he has to deal with. His adrenal factor, he's got two young kids and you know trying to struggle and take care of life and all that kind of stuff. Still not bad, he's holding up. It's a little bit weak. He could stand a little adrenal support. Uh, 
Let's see, his body weight, of course, is perfect. He's got like a 12% body fat or something. Uh, that tells you if he had to lose weight, of course, he's not interested in that data. He doesn't care about that. But he's interested in this. I told him, you know, you stay around 1,300 calories, you're probably going to live anywhere from 10 to 15% longer just from doing that. Watch the amount of food that you eat. We eat too much. And just because you're skinny doesn't mean anything. Well, I'm a skinny guy. I guarantee you. I used to eat too much. And, you know, everybody look at me and say, what is going on with that? You know, because I'd be eating anything and getting fat and now I'd be sucking it down. Just because you're skinny doesn't mean you're not eating too much. And just because you're fat doesn't mean you're eating too much. It just means your metabolism's off. That's all. Good yeah. mean you're eating too much. All right. M factor. His metabolism is not so hot. 50-year-old guy already starting to get hypothyroid. This man needs thyroid. For sure he needs thyroid. So I put him on a grain of thyroid. We'll start him off there. I'll tighter him. Thyroid blood tests are not useless. They are not useless. Thyroid blood tests almost useless. But not quite. You can use them real well to monitor your therapy. But in order to diagnose who needs thyroid, forget it. Go straight to look at the energy production. Because that rest, that's mostly what your energy production is determined by, is your thyroid. And most thyroids are poisoned by fluoride, cadmium, uh, obviously mercury, radiation, chiropractor, dentist, who knows what kind of wants to shoot radiation through there all the time. Uh, and, you know, between, I don't know what, and just plain old aging, thyroids go to pot. I myself take two and a half grains of thyroid, and uh, I find very few people over the age of 50 that don't need thyroid. Uh, but that's, this is a great way to screen for thyroid. He needs a little bit. C factor, to, like I told you, he's a health nut, not doing too bad. But you know what? He still eats apples and stuff. He's a healthy health nut, you know? He, He's going to eat the carbs, but he doesn't eat Twinkies and all that crap. He just eats good, quote, good carbs. But good carbs are bad, folks. I hate to tell you. All right, uh, so we got him off the fruit now. He's off the fruit. He'll do a lot better. Um, fat burning factor. Basically, by the way, this guy is not really complaining with anything. He has no complaints. So here's like the perfect guy. This problem. What I want to do every time when I go to my office, I want to see nothing but patients that don't have any complaints. That's my idea of no-brainer medicine. I see people that come into my office that feel great, and they sit down and say, I feel great. Help me stay that way for the next 60 years. That's what I want to hear. If you're that kind of patient, I want you. That, to me, is what doctors ought to be doing. Anyhow, he's like that. He's exactly like that. So, here I am fixing stuff that, quote, ain't even broke, so to speak. But by doing this test, I get to look into that middle stage where people are unhealthy. And I get to work on that before he finally comes down and sees me in 20 years with some kind of problem. I, look at this. So C factor's not bad, but when we exercise him, what happens? Now, this guy is skinny. So, you know, you, wouldn't, you would think he must burn fat great, huh? He doesn't. He doesn't burn fat great at all. It's that middle column. This guy is in that middle column. He thinks he's healthy. He can do any darn thing he used to do, but he's doing it less with fat, and he's getting more anaerobic as he does it. Actually, if you look at his EQ, he's not anaerobic yet. But you know in this guy, my EQ is 180. This guy should have an EQ at least 150 for what he does. He exercises way too hard. He's killing himself with exercise. I had to back this guy off. Uh, and fat burning factor, again, lots of niacin. And you know, uh, we can go into doses and all kinds of stuff in a sec, because I'm just going to finish up here. And then you know, I'm open for questions. We can get a little picky stuff if you want. But uh, I use lots of niacin. I will give him lots of L-carnitine uh, for fat burning. I will give him lipoic acid. I have a little powder that I made up for my patients that consists of pretty much all the stuff you were talking about with detoxification. This is where it's got the L-glutamine in it, the anastyl system, all. Because I know that toxicity is one of the main reasons my patients don't do well. So I have a little powder all made up that's got all that liver stuff in there. Plus, it's got all the antioxidants, because God knows you need them. And it's got all the micronutrients and all that stuff. So he'll be on that powder. It will help him burn fat. A hell of a lot of niacin in there. But I'll give him additional niacin. 
Uh, we'll also give him lots of L-carnitine in the order of two to three grams of L-carnitine a day. Of course, if he's switching over and eating more meat and getting off those apples, he's going to get more carnitine that way. And more protein. Protein itself, high protein diets do marvelous things for you. They get rid of osteoporosis, they build up muscles, they increase enzyme structures. High protein diets are pretty much the way to go. So if I take him off his carbs, he's either got, he's going to eat protein or fat. Fat ain't all that fun. So he'll probably eat more protein. He'll make up for it that way. And that's one of the reasons it works, I think. His biological age is 36 years old. Here's a little different case than the last one. She was 55 and a biological age of 78. She's a disaster. He's 50. He's got a biological age of 36. She's in good shape. Just needs a little fine tweaking here and there. And uh, I set him up. He got some exercise parameter. He says, what? I don't go over 120? I said, yeah. So what do you normally do? He says, 160. <laughs> You're killing yourself. Take it easy, man. And he like, kind of liked hearing that. He says, really? I said, yeah, you know what? And I told him a little story. I always tell my patients. Uh, in, in, when they introduced me, they said I won all these bicycle things, and I did. But what they didn't tell you is what I was racing for about eight years before I won anything. I was Mr. Hammerhead. I'm an obsessive person anyway. That's just the way I'm built. And uh, anything I do, I'm going to overdo it. Guarantee you. Like the carbs thing, right? No carbs. <laughs> um, so anyhow, when I exercised, I would like totally overdo it. I was like this guy, hammerhead, never won anything. Well, after about eight years, you know, not winning anything, I'm not even coming too bit close. You know, maybe if I came to top ten, that was pretty cool. Uh, I, you know, I was like, ah, whatever, you know, I'm just, I don't care that much, blah, 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 you know. I started taking it easy. Pretty soon, I didn't even go out and ride the bike at all for two days before the race. And instead of training 16 hours a week, now I'm down to five hours a week. And what's the point of even going to the race? Whatever. Guess who starts winning races? Now, I didn't know it at the time, what was going on. I just thought, geez, all the good guys aren't here today, you know? But it wasn't that, though. But what it was, was I was killing myself before, like this guy, and I just sort of so it arbitrarily kind of backed off in the work for him. So I told him that story, because you've got to tell somebody something, because hammerheads like me need to have a real reason why they don't torture themselves. Yeah. See, a lot of people that don't exercise, I finally learned this, they're smart. The ones that don't exercise, they're smart, they're intelligent. They know that when they're running out there, and they're anaerobic and killing themselves, somehow they know that. So they say, this can't be good for me, so I'm not going to do it. And they're right. Idiots like me go out there and say, I've got pain. This is great. I'm struggling. Yeah. So anyhow, I told him that, and hopefully he'll get it through that head of his, that it's OK. So that's it for the talk. And uh, we've got some questions. Uh, question, have I tested people who are 20 years old and is great? I have tested people, the oldest person I've tested is 94 years old. He tests as a 72 year old. He didn't when I first met him, but he now tests as a 72 year old. He lives at Incline Village, which is an altitude of 5,500 feet, and he hikes up a mountain to 7,200 feet three days a week. He's 94 years old. I have a, the, I mean, the, you're basing your, a lot of your ideas on what it's supposed to be like, and I wonder if you've measured anybody who's the way it's supposed to be like. Like somebody who's young and burns a lot of fat and doesn't... Yeah, anybody like below the age of 40, I'm comparing them to what they should be, according to the data banks for that age. Anybody over the age of 40, I'm comparing them to a 40-year-old. Does that answer your question? I mean, well, no, I'm mean, asking if you measure people who's, who get really great numbers on all this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yours truly. I get, you know... I defaulted at 30. Did you bring your numbers? What, no, I didn't, but I could tell you. But uh, I defaulted at 30 because what happens is the equations start to get really skewed when you get below 30. I mean, if you let it run out, you could have a biological age of 4. Well, what's that? <laughs> so, so we just defaulted at 30. That's as good as it can get if you're over 30. Now, if you're 18 years old, it'll go to 18 because I'm comparing you against a database 18-year-olders. And I've compared, you know, I've done five, six, seven-year-old kids. I've done autistic children. I uh, haven't done as many children as I'd like to do. 
Um, so I don't have that level of experience, but it's amazing and, and what lousy shape some of the kids are that they bring in that I test. They're in pretty hurting shape. Some of, of course, some of them are in great shape. Uh, the people I see can vary enormously. Uh, I'll never forget uh, a lady that came in and she walked. And the, my new patients, when they call up, I normally get this test before I even see them. So they walk in the door with the test. She's walking in the door. I'm looking at her. I'm saying, you know, my first impression before I knew much. She's about 30 pounds overweight. She's about 33 years old. I thought, you know, she's, you know, kind of peaks. She's got some problems. She can't be very healthy. She doesn't look healthy to me. Oh, I sit down. Numbers are knocking me off. What's with this? Yeah, she's a she's a, a world class mountain bike rider. She's 30 pounds overweight. Go figure. Okay. So a couple things I've learned: skinny ain't healthy. Fat ain't unhealthy. So, I mean, I really do have tested some fat people, 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight. They're very healthy, and a lot of skinny people that are a little disastrous waiting to happen. But yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people that test out great. And you know, you know what I do with them? I say, I don't know what you're doing. Don't tell me. Just keep doing it. Most of the time, when I test somebody, though, they don't test out great, and they're horrible with the fat. A lot of the times, they can make the energy but they're making it mostly from carbs. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> what are you, you're not talking so much about the type of exercise. I want to tell you, uh, the last few years I've hit upon this thing that uh, it, it's sort of a modified Arnold's program, uh, is that you can exercise, lift the heaviest weight you can lift, only eight to 10 times. If you can lift it more than 10 times, it's not heavy enough. And you do that every other day, uh, but if you don't want to be a big muscle man, all you do is maybe you pick out uh, three or four major muscle groups to exercise, and it, it takes only about five minutes. And, and this really seems to, to uh, they don't lose weight so much, but they lose fat, and they, and they lose inches. And that seems, and I don't think they're burning themselves up doing that. It's very easy to do that type of exercise. You can, in fact, I, I do let my patients get anaerobic. There's two forms of exercise I do. One is the aerobic kind. That's what everybody knows about. You're running, you're on the treadmill or whatever. I, I get them on, they have to adhere to that pulse rate, that, I, that range. I don't want them going lactic acidosis while they're doing that. Then the other form of exercise I do, so three days a week ideally, three days a week you do the aerobics, three days a week you alternate in between there, you do the weightlifting. That's anaerobic. That's a little different. Uh, for purposes of muscle building, you want to get anaerobic. I won't go into the biomechanics of that, but that's just how it shapes up. So what, what you only do the low end of the pulse. So the basically, kind of the way we do it is not like what you just said. And we, we do 10 reps. They're supposed to just be able to lift up the last rep. We do five muscle groups, you know, back, chest, and, uh, and stomach, and quads. Okay? And uh, they do 10 reps. And basically, uh, at the end of that, their heart rate is usually anaerobic. It should be, especially when they do the quad, big muscle. And they just sit down and read the newspaper until the heart rate comes down to that low end, and then they go on to do the next set. So we let them recover. They've got to recover before they go on to do the next set. But that's how I've done it. I'm not saying I have, like, the perfect exercise thing, but I will tell you that this form of exercise that I prescribe to my patients, they get good compliance with it because I'm not killing them. I'm giving them what they can handle. If they're in lousy shape, they're getting something for a person that's in lousy shape. They're in good shape. I'm pushing them. But I'm not doing anything that they can't handle and deal with well. And it really does work. You mentioned that protein, uh, people don't get enough protein. And uh, would you tell us how much protein per pound do you think is ideal? The reason I say that is I read that excess protein can leach calcium from the bone. You said yeah. it fights out the yeah, okay, she's bringing up a good point here. Uh, studies up until about, I think, 98 were indicating that excessive protein in your diet injured your kidneys and caused a net loss of calcium. That turns out to be wrong. In 1998, and several studies passed there. It turns out to be absolutely wrong. In fact, in one study, I can't quote it for you because I'm not good at that kind of thing, but they gave 500 grams a day of protein to the control group, to the experimental group, and the other group just had their regular diet. They measured calcium loss. There wasn't any net change. Now, 500 grams is a huge amount of protein. Uh, 
estimates, best estimates are when you look at the studies, and keep in mind that they normally tell you to eat something like about. Yeah, yeah. Normally it takes like 30 to 50 grams per day of protein. Optimally, you want to be in the uh, somewhere between 150 to 200 grams. So two to three times what they tell you. That's what the studies focus at in terms of muscle growth, muscle development. What percentage of fat? You know, that's a good question. Um, I don't. Uh, here's how I counsel my patient about eating. I personally am not the kind that likes to go around charting every crummy little thing I eat. I'm not about to do that. Now, I know some patients love that fact. Some of my patients beg me for that. Please, give me strict instructions on how to do everything from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. I can't relate to that personally. But you know what I'm talking about. Some people have to have that level of control, in which case we sit down and actually write out a thing for them. But normally what I tell my patients about that is this. Don't worry about it. Eat as much fat as you want. Just don't overeat. And when you eat fat, concentrate on omega-3. That's basically what I bang away at them. I say, you know, I don't really haven't met a whole lot of people that have eating disorders or on fat. Stop and think about it, all you physicians. Stop and think about it. When's the last time you had a bulimic come in to tell you that she, you know, you know, ate cheese? Or she ate T-bones? Ever had a bulimic that eats anything other than carbs? <coughs> Doesn't happen. So one of the reasons is that you can't eat that much. <laughs> you can't get that much in. So fat more or less limits itself. So the way I deal with it is basically tell them omega-3s, really go for the omega-3s, and you can eat as many omega-3s as you want. But I really want you to concentrate on protein, and I want you to get the darn carbs out of your diet. And I give them calories. I tell them to count calories. We do count calories. We do follow-ups follow to make sure they're in their calorie guidelines. So we give them some real actual parameters that they can use. It seems to work out well that way, but I don't give them anything like a book, like a strict thing they have to adhere to. Yes? Uh, some questions. What is the testing cost and stuff for And then uh, what cards do you read and have you All right, first question. What does the equipment cost? Uh, most people, this equipment is $35,000. Do you see why my wife got angry? Um, it, most, most docs just buy it on release, you know, and uh, it more than pays for itself, so that's, that's not an issue. Um, the, uh, what, the amount of carbs that I eat is basically none. I, now, what I mean by carbs, let me explain that, because you know there's carbs in milk, there's carbs in the T-bone, uh, there's carbs in lettuce, there just aren't much. So, when I say I don't eat carbs, here's what I mean. I don't eat grains. I don't eat fruit. I don't eat sweets other than fructose or xylitol. Uh, and you know, those I just more or less have a little fruit common sense about it. Fruits. Pardon me? Fruits. Uh, I don't eat beans. Uh, I eat nuts. Yeah. So basically it's the it's the root vegetables, uh, grains, fruit, and beans and sugars. That's what I don't eat. Now I do eat them. I just lied. I do eat them, but not very often. I eat them about the same way as you would kind of think you want to eat chocolate cake. I have them for a treat. Every three or four days, I'll eat a half an orange because it's a treat. You know, every now and then I go out to a restaurant, they got some killer bread, I have a piece. You know, but pretty much day in, day out, this guy doesn't eat carbs. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, so let's look at cholesterol. You know, let's just for a second digress if you can and address uh, the issue that you were raising about triglycerides. Uh, you made the statement that triglycerides, elevated triglycerides, were associated with insulin sens insensitivity. You're absolutely right. But why? Triglycerides are your gasoline, folks. That's your gasoline. That's what you burn for energy. So every time you eat something, and I don't care whether you ate a crate of oranges, or you ate a crate of cheese or butter. It doesn't make any difference if it's fat or sugar that you eat. It gets into your intestines, goes straight to your liver to go any place else, and your liver converts it to triglycerides. 100, close to 100% of that food that you eat. So all this crap about eating low fat is going to lower your fats is stupid. 
every carb, almost all the carbohydrates you eat immediately get converted to fat anyway. So you might as well just eat the fat. So that's what triglycerides are. You measure your triglycerides after you eat. I don't care whether you eat an orange or whether you eat a piece of butter. It doesn't make any difference. Your triglycerides are going to go up. Because that's what you live off of, at least what you're supposed to live off of. You're supposed to be burning those triglycerides for energy. But what if you're not? What if you live off sugar? What if you made that shift I just told you about? What happens to your triglycerides? They go up. You don't burn them. And that's the same, same basic idea with cholesterol and lipoproteins and all the other fats. If your fat, to the degree that your fat metabolism is down, your blood fats go up. Same idea. They, they, they all, the, what low density is a combination of triglycerides and other lipid factors. So it's all the same. That's what I want to tell you. If you get off the carbs, they all come tumbling down unless you have some sort of metabolic disturbance like hypothyroidism. Classic marker for elevated LDL. Classic. The most classic. Hypothyroidism. In fact, at the turn of the century, that was how you diagnosed low thyroid. Less problems. So uh, unless there's a metabolic disturbance, you get on this kind of carbohydrate thing that I'm on. And when I went on, I'll just give you some personal numbers, but I can give you like crazy numbers. I've tell you people who have triglycerides of 800 who now have 80, and they're not on a drug. They're just doing what I told you today. My uh, my cholesterol, uh, my LDL used to be 180 way back when. Right now, my LDL is 70. I don't take any lipid lowering drugs. Yeah, I take thyroid. I do all the, you know, the stuff that I would talk to you guys about. Yes, sir? Carrots, uh, what do you see that uh, the vegetables in general are confused? Your root vegetables, the starchy root vegetables, I don't eat them. That's a carrot? Yeah, it would be carrots, beets, rutabagos, you know, potatoes, potatoes mostly. That's what we're talking about. Beans are okay. Beans? No, green beans green are legumes, and I avoid beans too. Green beans. Green beans are more or less okay. You know, the green beans. The string beans, they, they, they don't have that much carb in them. You're better off with the leafy type stuff and with uh, uh, like cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, chard, lettuce, zucchini. I mean, that's more or less the way to go. Have you tested Gregory? He has a fruitarian. I'm sorry? I think Gregory has a fruitarian diet where he says he eats nothing but fruit. And I wonder how you would eat. Could be testing him and see how his body is. Sign him up. Let's look at him. See what he does. I mean, the beauty, oh, seriously, that's what I, as a scientist, I love this test. Because that question you just asked, I mean, that's the question I love to ask. Here's a guy doing something that's really strange. What if he's healthier than Sam? Wouldn't it be neat to know? You know, so let's test and find out. But you know, I don't have to like wave a crystal or get a CBC or do something dumb that doesn't tell me anything. In this case, I can actually get some hardcore quantitative data and sort of figure it out. Just I emailed Lori Dean because I was alarmed when I saw my triglycerides were only 15. Your triglycerides, repeat the lab test. Her triglycerides were only 15. And uh, I would repeat the lab test. You know, labs are wrong like only half the time or something. So whenever something screwy comes back, I immediately repeat the lab test. Now, if your every test... Every time I've had a lab test, though, in all my, you know, every two years, it's always way down there. Your triglycerides are 15? Okay. Um, I think that's very good. I mean, obviously, you have some sort of metabolic issue, and it seems like it's a good one. Like, you burn fat really, really, really good. Uh, but, you know, I would want to get a bioenergy test on you and just make sure that you're as good as I think you are, because normally in my book, the lower your triglyceride, the better. That's a really good sign for me, because that means to me your fat metabolism is really good. But that's incredibly low. Yes, sir? Yeah, what about the uh, long-lived societies like the Okinawans? Uh, I guess they're one of the longest living societies uh, around. And they eat the carbs, and they only eat a little protein in the form of fish, but eat a lot of vegetables. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, as I said, I was in Singapore not too long ago uh, giving a lecture. Uh, who did I see there? But Gary Gordon. What? You know, 
<laughs> you can't get away from that guy. But uh, uh, have, well, all over halfway across the world, there he is. Oh, Frank, I gotta tell you something. I got, <laughs> I got this new stuff from London that cures everything. You gotta hear it. Okay, so uh, I digress. I digress. Um, so, uh, and I'm walking around Singapore, and what are they eating in Singapore? I mean, I'm eating with these guys for a week, okay? They eat like fruit. I'm all eating fruit all day long. Uh, they eat rice all the time. Uh, I mean, they have a fair amount of carbs in their diet, okay? You ain't finding one fat person in Singapore. <laughs> and if you do, they're German or English, okay? So there's a few. But I swear to God, it's just strange. They're, they're all skinny, every one of them. And I asked those guys, what's the deal? How come everybody here is skinny? He says, well, we're obsessed with it. They all take, even skinny people take uh, diet vitamins and stuff. I said, well, okay, you know, but uh, your question is very well put. The people I look at are almost all Anglo-Saxon. I don't have hardly any blacks. I have a few Hispanics, like no Asians. I don't know that I've ever, well, I have that one Asian in San Francisco, but, you know, maybe a few Asians. But mostly we're talking white Anglo-Saxon from Carson City. That's who I'm talking about. Now, we're starting to get other databases now that some of these other centers have been set up. But it seems pretty apparent to me that Anglo-Saxon genetics have to be pretty much fat protein genetics. You know, our ancestors, our Anglo-Saxon ancestors, you know, six months out of the year, they could find a leaf. They probably got all pumped up over it, you know, much less fruit and stuff all over the place to eat. All they ever ate was meat and fat. That's, you know, most of the time. Now, during the summer, maybe every now and then they found the fruit berry or something, you know. But, so genetically speaking, you can understand why little people in the tropics, I mean, they got fruit all year long. They got leaves all year long. So they may very likely have a different genetics. So I'm just speaking about my genetic, what's going on with me. But I mean, that's kind of the nice thing about the test. Because if, if you have the genetics for it, and some do, I'm, I literally have some people that have to be like me. Zero carbs. In order to get the numbers I want to see, bang, none, ever. I have other people that they don't. They, they come in. I've seen some people that suck down candy two or three times a day, and they test okay. They're usually like 24 years old, incidentally. But they'll test out okay. So for them, it's working. Not a problem. Now, I got a feeling they're not going to be doing that too long. But the point is that for that point in time, with their particular genetics and the way their lifestyle is, they can get away with that percent. That C factor will tell you. If somebody says to me, how many carbs should I eat ideally, I say, eat enough carbs so that your C factor doesn't dip below 100. You know, Frank, a lot of times there's trade-offs in life, and if you optimize one thing, you lose someplace else. And it seems to me possible that if you, if you optimize energy production like you're talking about, you might lose uh, in other areas, for example, antioxidants. If you don't eat fruits and you don't eat beans, which are two of the great sources of antioxidants, you might not get enough antioxidants. You might not get a lot of the micronutrients. Now, if, if you supplement, you could maybe overcome that, but let, you know... Name, name me <laughs> a nutrient or a vitamin you can't find in a vegetable. Name me one. The, the, the vegetables you you you, you permit. Name me one. You, I will name you nutrients and my minerals you can't find in fruits. But you can't name me one nutrient. I, no, your question is well put, and yeah. that's my answer. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I really do push vegetables. I'm not like an Atkins guy that just says eat pea bones all day long. So, so when you say carbs, I mean, you mean starches in a broad sense. Yeah, I mean that's stuff I just carbs. talked about. You mean yeah. starchy carbs because you do you do believe in vegetables and you do believe in salads, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah, so uh, it's not like zero carbs. Right, it's, gotcha. Okay. But it's grains, beans, uh, fruit, sugars, and root vegetables. That's what I mean. Uh -huh. But all the rest is okay. You know, uh, that's not really an issue. Yeah, okay, I've yet you. to see somebody that's on that program and doesn't have a C factor over 100. It just that hasn't happened yet. Uh -huh. So you're so you're an advocate of the paleo diet. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Paleo diet, paleo diet, paleo diet. Paleo caveman type diet. He's yeah, saying, I'm an advocate for that. And yeah, that is what it amounts to. Now, I didn't go into it this way. It's just the way it turned out. Yes, ma'am. How do you deal with people that you know have been exposed to pesticides and that kind of thing and might have mitochondrial damage? Um, 
one of the guys in LA that now has this test, Dr. Mm -hmm. Murray Susser, when I called him up 10 months ago and said, I have a test for mitochondrial function, he was smart, to say, he was smart enough to say, you do? Tell me about it. I told him about it, he said, send me one. Because he appreciates that there's nothing more important to measure than mitochondrial function, period. That is the bottom line, where you make your energy. Okay? So yeah, what poisons that? Well, the previous lecture, talking about all the stuff that wrecks it. So if you want to know if the styrofoam cups are really getting into your system, what's your EQ? If your EQ is below 100, you're eating too many styrofoam. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So we do get a glimpse into what's going on in your mitochondria. This has been a great evening. We want to break. Thank you very much, Frank.